Okay. Allegedly, that is recording. And so I'll find out if it's not or not. Everybody, a definition. Importance of knowing this form of the definition is not as high, but we have to have it here because it's good to see where it comes from. So let F be differentiable at some point A, B. So remember, we would say in Calc 1, let F be differentiable at X equals A. Well, now we have two variables in our input space. So we say that F be now differentiable at X, Y equals A, B. Essentially, that's what's happening here. And we're also going to let some vector U, which is U1, U2, this is going to be a unit vector. Unit vector. This is a detail that's easy to forget. So don't forget that that u is a unit vector uh, in the xy plane. So the directional derivative. The directional derivative. Yes, there are more. Directional derivative of the function f at this input point a b in the direction because if we have if we have a directional derivative we need to indicate and so that's what this vector is going to be so in the direction of our unit vector u here's how we notate this so we use a capital D and we subscript the vector that gives the direction. So this is indicating we're doing a derivative. We're doing it in this direction, in the pointing in the direction of whatever our unit vector is. And then of which function? F. That's the function we're performing this on. And if we want to specify the specific point, I can just throw that on right there. So in the same way that in Calc 1, if I just said F prime, OK, well, that's just the derivative in general. But if I lock it down and say F prime, of a, now we know what it's the derivative of that point a. So that's kind of what this is. This isn't the derivative in general. This is the derivative of this function specifically going in this direction um, at this specific point. Does that make sense? Okay. And so this is the limit. And this is going to be very reminiscent to calc 1, right? It's a function. It's a, it's a rise over a run, but now generalized to the plane h u1 b plus h u2 minus f a b all of b provided this limit exists because this limit doesn't always have to exist provided the limit exists so if the limit doesn't exist then the directional derivative does not exist and that can happen Did I unmute? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so here I'll give you a little. Um, let me let me give you an idea of what's happening here. So here's a three dimensional space. All right. So this is x, y, z. Okay. Now, if I have some sort of surface going on, something like that. And so this is three-dimensional. At every single, so, so what we've done so far, the partial derivatives with respect to x and then the partial derivatives with respect to y. That's as if we kind of took, uh, we were just looking at, if we're, OK, I thought that was something else. Um, if we're going along x. So if you imagine kind of taking a board and chopping down on the x-axis and seeing how your function is decreasing along that specific plane, that's really what you're measuring with the partial with respect to x. And then when you do it with respect to y, then now instead of cutting it this way, you're going to cut it so that it's parallel to this y, yz, and then however it's changing like that. And so now, technically, though, we got an infinite number of directions that this surface has. And so if I'm at some input point a, b, some input point a, b, and then I don't want to know the generic 
way that the surface is changing if I'm locked specifically onto this axis or this axis? What if I want to go somewhere in the middle, <clears throat> right? So what if I want to know how it's going down the slope this way? So how many of you guys have gone sledding before you grew up where there was snow, okay? And so it's like when you go at the top of a sledding hill, depending on what kind of thing you have, sometimes hills are uneven, right? So it'll be steeper in some areas and in areas it'll be less shallow. Or wait, have, have you gone skiing before also? And see, or at least know what skiing hills look like? So you can choose to go on the bunny hills, which are nice and easy. And you can just kind of go down the hill without going super fast. And then, then there's the triple diamond path, which is like that. Okay. But the idea is off of certain surfaces, depending on which direction you choose to go down the hill, you'll experience different rates of change. That's what this tool is for. So instead of restricting it onto X and Y, we can say, well, I have full control now over actually which direction I'm going to go up or down this, you know, changing sl slope or surface or ground or terrain. And I can actually now model exactly how much I'm either going up or going down. Make sense? So it's, what? You can like find like the partial components of the X and Y. It's not necessarily in line with X and Y, so it wouldn't possible with that as well. Very good question. Actually, I, it's almost like I paid you to ask that question. Because what I had here for the star is we can understand this as basically, yeah, the new, you think of your components, you think of Fx and Fy as the building block components, where this derivative now becomes a weighted average of how much of it is in the x direction, how much is in the y direction. So the directional derivative duf is weighted. Well, it's a weighted, I should say. Is a weighted average of the partial derivative f x and f y with the components of the direction that were being specified u to get right there. Serving as the weights. So that's the interaction between your fx and your fy. So conceptually, you can think about it uh, in the computation. And that intuitively makes sense, right? Because in physics, you develop kind of systems of if I have two vectors, you're going to start thinking of the i vector and the j vector as going along the x and the y directions as unit vectors, and this u being some. Um, weighted average of those components on x and y, because it's in the input space. Okay. So practically speaking, because you sure as goodness not going to be using this every single time, here is the theorem that you're going to want to, we're going to, we're going to improve on this, but we, we start with this. So it's the D U F. Notice, uh, well, I'll specify a point actually. So that's so if you're evaluating this specifically at the point A, B, this is going to be a vector. So F, X evaluated at A, B, F, Y evaluated at A, B. And you take the dot product with your unit vector. So you can write this down, but we're going to improve on this. But you need to know where the building block is coming from. So have this in your notes so that you'll understand when we construct the, the, the computational formula. And then give me thumbs up when you're all good, because I'll erase all of this. You know, some people, they, they either don't know what to do with the awkward pauses in silence, or they're perfectly fine with it. The people who are perfectly fine with it are the people who are like me and write at like 
half a mile an hour. <laughs> I remember I remember being in this one class where the, all of the information would be up for like four seconds before going on to the next thing. And I almost cried every single day in that class. So I just started taking phone pictures and transcribing later, but it was so annoying. So that's why I give time. It's also calc great. So I mean, it takes a minute to kind of let it sit. Okay, so let's get to the gradient. I like the gradients. I think the gradient is one of my favorite things about Cal 3 as just a class in general. Um, so we're going to let F be differentiable. At um, XY, which is some point. So the gradient. Um, and at this point x y is the and then now we're going to start invoking some chapter thirteen material vector value function. If you want to remember what that is, vector value function. The vector where the individual like components of that vector are scalar value function. So this is how we notate it: an upside down delta, capital delta. And if you do LaTeX, it's slash nabla with AMS symbol package, I think. And but you just but you just read it as gradient or del if you want to call it del. Uh, del at x y is equal to partial derivative of x at x y in the x component. And what do you think? Using common sense is going to be the y component. <laughs> the only reason I introduced the del here is because this makes a massive comeback in chapter 17. And so it's important to know. Yeah. Uh, what is del? del? Oh, it's just this upside down triangle. Three. So you don't have to try to read your notes and be like, uh, upside down triangle f of xy. You could either say the gradient of x y f x y or del f x y. Yeah. <laughs> Questions. Okay. So now compare this with the with the definition or the theorem that we just did, right? For the formula of the directional derivative. This is like the entire first chunk. Mm -hmm. So really, we have a dot product where we can express <coughs> the directional derivative d u f at some point a b. We can now express this. The first chunk is just the gradient, right, at your point AB. So whatever the gradient is at your point AB. And we do it in dot product with our unit vector. Yeah, it's a lot. What does that say? This one? Yeah. This is slash. Nabla and ABLA. So if you use LaTeX, I think this is in the AMS symbol packages. That, that's a AB, right? AB. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I need to work on that. So here's here's what I want to make a connection for you because when uh, this is a I didn't really realize this until chapter 17 when I took this class. Um, but it's really, really helpful. So I'll show it to you guys. So recall from Calc 1 that after you kind of learn about derivatives, you kind of treat it as an operation to some extent, right? So the d dx, every single time you see d dx by itself, this in itself is not a derivative. We all understand that this in itself is not a derivative of anything. Like you haven't specified what it's a derivative of. But the moment we then specify what we want it to act on, so it's like some sort of a function, then we understand, okay, well, there's it's a derivative, it's a friend. So that's that's how we kind of see this notation in Calc 1. And so what's happening is I want you to think of the del operator 
just as an isolated DBX, but generalized now to accommodate you know, partial derivatives. So think of the DEL, and I use three bars to indicate that this isn't like equals. I'm not saying they are the same thing, but it's defined to be basically instead of regular DDX, partial, partial, without a function specified, <clears throat> and then partial, partial Y. Are we necessarily restricted to only two components? No, it's going to be just like going on as long as we want. So I'll just do it in terms of three dimensions here, just for the sake of having an example here. But technically, if you had 10 different variables, you could just index it all the way down. So this is what this operator is. So the Dell operator is very, very, it basically acts like the calc three version of DDX. So if you see DDX in calc one, you think, oh, OK, that's the derivative operation. When you see a Dell in front of a function, think, oh, that's just the calc three version of my DDX. And I'm going to be doing my partial Partial, 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 because every single component has to be associated. So that means that's the partial derivative of whatever, right? Yeah, here, I'll show you what it looks like. So if we now do uh, the del operator with some function, okay, I'll let you guys choose. How many variables do we want it to choose? One. <laughs> Count three. three. That's the one variable case. Three. Three, okay. So let's do P, Q, and R. Okay. The actual letters don't matter. I'm just trying to convince you to uh, get away from marrying the notation, substituting out with the concept. Um, what this means, when you see this, think, oh, well, that's just the calc 3 version of DTX. So we got this partial, partial P, partial, partial Q, and partial, partial R. Our function. Do you see? Do you see that the similarities between what's coming from derivative operation, the function specified, derivative operation, the function specified. Because now, when we put this scalar value function into here, we're going to have the partial of our function partial p, partial f, partial q, partial uh, f, partial. And if you really think about it, all we're doing is we're taking this vector value thing, which are multiple variables, and we're going to say, for every single component, partial differentiate with respect to its own component. So this is the P component. So for the P component, we're going to differentiate with respect to P. For the Q component, then we'll differentiate with respect to the Q component. And then R component, we'll differentiate with respect to R. And if you wanted to do this in a more uh, sweet notation, yeah, I like it. F P F Q F R. If I can draw right. Does that make sense? So that's all this gradient really is doing. It's basically saying, okay, for the price of one, you get to do three partial derivatives in one question. And that's all there is to it. There's nothing really new. Okay, okay. So it's one twenty-five. I'll finish these two terms. And then we'll just run a bunch of examples because there's really nothing too crazy new here. So, uh, do I want to put it? Yeah, I'll race. And while I erase, I want you to remember the stuff that we did with dot product. Do you guys remember uh, the definition of a dot product? The alignment of two vectors. Yeah, so it's a measure of how parallel they are, but. In terms of the trigonometric function, how do we define the dot product? Yeah. So look through your notes, and you'll notice if you wrote down the L, then the directional derivative, as is a dot product in itself, which means the directional derivative can be written and expressed uh, with all the other dot product properties. And all of those properties of the dot product are relevant. So we have, just as a recall, so recall. If the directional derivative is the gradient dot u, then that means it's the magnitude of this vector times the magnitude of this vector cosine theta. Everyone good with that? Here's the thing, though. What's special about u? Yeah, it's a unit vector. So what's the magnitude of a unit vector always going to be? Yeah, one. So we're really multiplying 
This times one times cosine. So this is just yeah. the magnitude of the gradient of f cosine theta. The directional derivative is going to be is going to be entirely the, the size of it's entirely based off of the angle between your direction and the gradient. And since it's the dot product is a measure of how aligned the vectors are, the more aligned your direction is with this gradient vector that we define, then the greater your rate of change. Now, what if you're perfectly aligned? So if theta is zero and cosine of zero is what? One. One. So then the directional derivative itself at its maximum value is what? Just the magnitude of your gradient. So the gradient suddenly becomes really important because when we interpret in physical interpretations of things, so it's like if you were going skiing and you wanted to know the steepest portion, well, if you're able to get an equation that told you what the surface of your hill is, you can find this gradient. And essentially, knowing that if theta is zero here, in other words, the direction you're trying to go in with respect to the gradient, is that zero, then you're going to be have maximum rate of change. This has a very, very important physical application here. So really, I'm going to write out a theorem, and it's going to be a lot of words, and it's going to look like a lot of information. But in reality, everything about the theorem is just, OK, what do I know about dot product properties? Well, it's a dot product, so everything about dot products is going to be true still. And then it's just reinterpreting in terms of these new definitions. Another thing, dot, if the dot product is 0, what does that mean? They're perpendicular. Yeah, they're perpendicular. So in the event that we are moving in a direction that is orthogonal to this gradient direction, are we changing at all? No. We stay at the same altitude if we're moving perpendicular to the gradient. Okay? So all of these observations, we just kind of summarize in words now. So really, this is the idea. If you can start here, you can reconstruct all of the ideas of the theorem, and they're all pretty much intuitive from how the dot products work. But to have it now written out, you can anticipate kind of what you're going to be seeing here. So let F be differential at a point A, B with the gradient at A, B. We just want to make sure this is a zero vector. Notice I say zero vector. Biggest mistake people are going to make is they're going to think that the gradient is a scalar. By definition, the gradient is a vector valued function. So don't be treating the gradient like it's a scalar. If any of you write something that says that the gradient in some way is equivalent to a scalar, I just won't read it because it's wrong. Okay? So make sure you understand that gradients are vectors. <clears throat> Here's another reminder you can't take a dot product of a scalar with a vector. That doesn't exist. It's undefined. So the very definition of the directional derivative cues you in to don't treat the uh, the gradient like a scale. It's a vector. Why did you get a <laughs> Because the, it's because of the del. Yeah. So conventionally, yeah, we understand the del f to be a vector. Wait, a triangle? Yeah, it's, it's basically an upside down delta. So regular delta looks like oh. a triangle. Yeah. So then the del is just upside down. And other funny shapes that mathematicians have used because we run out of stuff to use. <laughs> okay, so let's look at these properties. Number one, F has its maximum rate of increase. Has its maximum rate of, of increase at the point A. In the direction of the gradient, the gradient is down F A B, and the rate of change, rate of change in this direction. is the magnitude. Why do we need a magnitude around our gradient? Because gradient is a vector. Exactly what Sam said. Gradient's a vector. 
a rate of change is a description of the scalar quantity. To get the scalar quantity out of this vector, we just need to find the two point. We don't want its direction. Oh, so basically for here, what you can do is you can say, what if this direction u is in this, the direction of the gradient itself, right? So u has to be a unit vector there. So if I were to just have a gradient, this is not necessarily always going to have a magnitude of one. How can I guarantee and turn this into like a gradient unit vector direction? Yeah, divide it by its magnitude. So I can divide it by its magnitude. So now this is a unit vector. So let's substitute u is equal to this into our formula. And if we do that, so we have d sub, oh, this is going to be fun, but d sub, our unit vector is going to be the gradient of f over its own magnitude of the function. Everyone follow that? So this is just a clunky u. If I plug it into the formula, so we have gradient f dot, well, I'm working on the dot product of our unit vector. So here's our unit vector. Now, you guys had to prove this on exam one. But the, a vector dot product with itself is what? Sure. Right? And specifically, it's magnitude squared over the magnitude. Make sense? Yeah. Thumbs up if you see why this has to get in here. Okay. And so then obviously, now that's a scalar squared over the same scalar, so we can simplify that, and it becomes lo and behold, shocker. Hmm. Maybe exam question, maybe. Okay. Uh, and so, so basically, if, if we can know that this is how we increase the most, just going the opposite direction. So imagine you're standing, you're, you're standing, you're trying to climb up. Oh, have you ever had to walk um, from, from EMR or whatever up to upper lot and that hill? Yeah. It's basically, you're looking at that. There's mm -hmm. that one really dangerously steep, slippery like, sidewalk thing that gets icy. So it's like if you're standing on the middle of that, and if the rate of greatest increases, like, you know, going up to the parking lot, Intuitively, the, the, the direction of the greatest decrease is basically just well the opposite direction. Just turn around and you know, now you're going. You're decreasing as um, the maximum amount that you could be at that particular point that you're standing. So really, property two, don't think of it as a completely separate thing. It's just piggybacking off of the fact that we're increasing the most in the direction of the gradient. And then if you just happen to turn that around and hit it with a minus sign, you're obviously going to be just now decreasing. So F has its maximum uh, uh, rate of decrease at our point B in the direction of, instead of now the gradient, we just flip that vector around with minus, so it's negative gradient at AB. And so, the rate of change in this direction is what is what what, what is it going to be? Yes, just the negative version of whatever the magnitude was going up. So the second property is really comes from the first one. And then the third one, the third one is really just putting into English the understanding that we know that dot product between two vectors, if that ends up being zero, the only way that happens is if they're orthogonal to each other. So we just put that into English here and we say the directional derivative, the directional derivative is zero in any direction in any direction or orthogonal as expected to what the gradient is. Notice that the gradient here is not being given in a magnitude. Why? Because it's direction. 
vector. We need this direction. That's the whole point of this. So we're getting it's we're treating this, we're understanding this as a vector for its direction, not just how big it is. The first two things are just kind of yes, direction, but then also how how big, how much magnitude there. Here we just know that we already know the magnitude of that. It's gonna be zero specifically when we're orthogonal to the greatest. Okay. Feeling pretty good with that. There's just one more little theorem thing, and I have a little nice picture for it. So this one's the next thing is pretty straightforward. And then we can start doing computations. The last call. Sweet. <laughs> Thanks. No. We oh well, I only erased wreck. <laughs> <laughs> This is actually one of the cool. So I, I remember doing this. Um, I remember doing this in the shower one morning when I was getting ready for class, and I thought to myself, "Wait a second. What if I just took my grade? Because technically this is a vector, and I had been doing practice on various e's. And I thought, huh? What if I just made that in? And so before I had read the textbook, I was able to write out the theorem. So believe it or not, you can you can figure this stuff out. You don't need permission from the textbook to learn. Um, you paid too much money to be doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I really like this. Okay. Um, you good? I know this is something that all of you can personally relate to, but as you're eating your mode, you're thinking about calculus <laughs> and uh, all the kinds of things. If you practice applying these definitions to silly mundane things that you run into while you're walking to classes or you're interacting or just other things in general or driving your cars, I think you'd be surprised how much quickly or how much quicker uh, the concepts integrate in your use. You seek out how they actually uh, manifest in the physical world because you're all engineers. So that's kind of your job is to translate these things into uh, physical, into um, and this is very, very applicable. So the last little thing here, theoretically at least, the theorem is given a function f, which will be differentiable, differentiable at b d of i and it to the level curve, the level curve of F at your point A B is orthogonal to the gradient to the gradient, gradient of F at A B divided and again, we just want to make sure the gradient is not zero vector. Divide our gradient to the top of your vector. Now, this theorem is just a restatement of that idea of the dot product. If it's zero, then they're orthogonal. Because now we're just applying it to this idea of level curve. And if you remember what those level curves were, that's basically a curve of if you were to trace out all of the same altitude. Basically, so what kind of a curve you can make if you were to slice off all of the same altitudes on your surface and then project it down onto the x, y plane. So suppose here's your interface, and so suppose you got some sort of like a like a weird dune, like a sand dune shape or whatever, and you want to fix it at a certain elevation, certain altitude in the uh, how high you are up. And so suppose the sand is organized kind of like a so obviously, as you go up, this would get smaller, and as you go down, it would get broader out. But we're just looking at this one isolated level curve. And so suppose uh, we know that because this is a level curve, here's my x, here's my y. We know that every single point along this level curve is the same elevation on the actual um, function. And so suppose you're playing a game with your friends. You're at the sand dune, and you say, "Okay, we're going to walk around without. We're going to walk around the entire thing without changing our elevation." In other words, 
we got to get all the way around the sand dune without ever having a directional derivative that is non-zero. So rate of change up and down wise, zero, flat. Yet we're going to traverse all the way around. So what we know is suppose you were to start at point A, B. A, B. And then you were walking this way. So here's a tangent. So you would be what here's tangent. I'll call that T vector. Now, if you're walking tangent to this level curve, you're not changing your elevation. And if you're not changing your elevation, your directional derivative is zero. But we know that the only way the directional derivative can be zero is if the gradient and your direction you're going in are orthogonal. So if at this instant you're going in this direction tangent along this level curve, the only way to avoid actually changing and avoid having a non-zero directional derivative is to be orthogonal to that direction. So the gradient is orthogonal to tangent to that. Because if you think about it, if it instead, if you were having a race, and instead of trying to go around the sand dune without changing elevation, and the race was just who can get up to the top of the sand dune the fastest, you better be taking the gradient line, because that's going to get you there the fastest. And so say you're walking around, and then you, you reach another point, say, after a little while, you get to CD. And so now you're, you're, you're at this instant, you're walking tangent to your level curve, so your direction is that way. And so that means at this instant, the gradient to the, the fastest increase would be orthogonal. And now at CD instead of AB. So that's all that theorem is saying. Make sense? Okay. Cool. Perfect. So we have time to do some problems. Here's a function. Let's start off easy so that we can ease ourselves into using this tool x squared plus 2xy minus y cubed. Okay? So let's start by finding the gradient. Remember I put this? This is indicating to you, it's, you think ddx operation, but now <coughs> big boy calculus with multiple gradients. Okay? So the gradient is a vector. Ooh, you know what I should have? I'm going to write this down here. Gradient is uh, <laughs> Is that a noble? Gradient mm, Maybe. Maybe I'll just make that an example. <laughs> what is gradient? It's important enough to know. Well, because the issue is the issue is going to be the moment you get away from the gradient being a vector, well, you, you just you can't get past. The concept isn't compatible with misunderstanding this. It is fundamentally a vector. You can't treat it as a scale or anything else. So here, because this is a gradient, here's the thing. You've already done a whole week on partial derivatives. So if this, I'm not asking you to find fx, okay? Because fx would just be, okay, yeah, I can just take the partial derivative and that's that. But now I'm asking for the gradient. I'm asking for a vector. What are the components of those vectors? Well, each of those partials now. So fx and now fy. So here we have how many variables? Two. Okay. So the first component is going to be f partial x. What's the y component going to be? The partial y. Right. So it's not rocket science. So we just know that in hand. Two for the price of one. Okay. Fx is going to be two x plus two y. What's the y component going to be? Two x minus two y. Three y squared. Three y squared. That that's a gradient. Okay. Let's do another one. F x y is equal to. Oh, this is kind of cute. Okay. Sine x cosine. 
Cody. So the gradient. What's the x component? Uh, cosine x plus y. What? Cosine x cosine. And what's the next? What's the y component gonna be? Sine. Sine. Questions, concerns, complaints for the department. Okay. Now yeah, let's do another one. Let me just erase all this because I can't get through. Okay. Okay. So, what if we did f x y as y times the natural log of x y? And let's do the gradient. The gradient. A gradient is a what? That was very unconvincing, considering I double started and underlined it. What is a gradient? A vector. What is a gradient? A vector. What's a vector? A gradient. Uh, <laughs> that sounded like the Americans trying to fight the Battle of Caltan for the Revolutionary. Sure. Okay. So if a gradient is a vector, what's the x component? Y over x y. It's a, well, just take it take one piece at a time. So the, the, it's partial with respect to x, and the natural log rule is you chuck it in the basement, right? So you get a constant over the argument, and then the chain rule is that we multiply that and then the constant. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can, we can simplify the next step. And then the y component is going to be a product rule because we have those in the so left. Times the derivative of this with respect to y being the variable, which would be one over x y times the constant. So that's left the right. Now we do right the left. So right times the derivative of the left with respect to y. Yeah, so now we can simplify. Ooh, I have a pet peeve because a lot of you guys do this. Okay. Is I noticed a lot of you saw like after writing this, you noticed okay, well the y's are gonna cancel, and so what you do is you do this horrible thing, where you like y over x y times y, and then like there'll be other stuff, and then like you'll smudge it, and then it'll be like y over x, what it simplifies to, and then you write other stuff, and then you'll try to go to the next line after completely destroying your line of reasoning. Okay, do math in order or pay the consequences, okay? Because here, when things get more complicated with chain rules, with product rules and quotients, chain rules and other things that stack on top of each other, you can't afford to be trying to, if you're going to do it in your head, just do it in your head. If you can't do it in your head, then you're like me. And then you just write out the step because you can always simplify algebra later, okay? Okay. Also, it's a matter of partial credit as well because for this kind of a step, if you're trying to do an algebraic shortcut in your head, but then you actually do it wrong, well, if you're claiming that that's your first step, it's gone. So you just lost your opportunity to get credit for something because I can't know for certain if you just made a dumb mistake and got lucky or where you're getting your ideas from. So it's okay to have unsimplified work when you plug stuff in or do it. Simplify your algebra later, do it step by step. So now it's much easier for me to go y over x. Because when I'm reading this work, I say, okay, they performed the rules, then they recognize the cancellation. It's much easier to read. Let me just like a slash over the, uh, like slash out where you can see the numbers, like the letters. Yeah, you could, you, so if you wanted to slap and slash, that's okay. But so long as you have the separate steps, because then I know that you accounted for it. 
Because here, we would have to slash this one, this one, this one, this one. And so see how messy it gets so quickly. So one plus half log. Mm. Okay, let's do a directional derivative question so we can at least get through one of those. Because Pearson's going to make you do a bunch of stuff anyway. Okay. This is, I'm going to show you this one because this is going to be the most applicable skill I want you to be taking out of this section. Um, find the directional derivative of u of f, specifically at the point 3 comma minus 1, if your function f of x y is 3 minus x squared over 10 plus x y. Wow. X y squared over 10. And the unit vector that we're using is, is 1 over root 2 and minus 1 over root 2. Oh. Is that the triangle or do you like the triangle? Okay, no. Well, this is this is a capital D. So this is D, so partial, this is the directional derivative. Okay. Yeah. So here's your formula as a reminder. Gradient at a b dot u. And so if you're going to solve this problem, you don't have to stare at it. You can just build your pieces and plug it in. So let's get the gradient first. Okay, the gradient of f, x, y. Notice I'm not plugging the point in yet. Is going to, what's a gradient? A gradient is a vector. A gradient is a vector. And so x component, we're going to have minus x over 5, and then plus y squared over 10. y component is going to be the partial of y now, so 0, 0, boom. So we get 1 fifth xy, so xy over 5. This is the gradient without the point. Now we plug in the point 3 minus 1 x is equal to 3, so minus 3 fifths plus y is equal to minus 1, minus 1 squared over 10. x is 3, y is minus 1 over 5. So now I simplify, and I've got myself 1 tenth here, and then this will be minus 6 tenths. So 1 minus 6 is minus 5. Minus 5 tenths or minus 1 half. Minus 3 fifths. So here is this part. Do you see how we're just basically laundry listing this thing? So sometimes recipes, you have to make a sauce or a marinade as an intermediate step. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that was the triangle upside down, right? That after it equals like D, like the, the like on top. Directional derivative, gradient. Yeah. Okay. Gradient, gradient. Yeah. So the directional derivative at u for this function at 3 minus 1, well, we have the gradient at our point. So that's this vector. Minus 1 half minus 3 fifths dot, and the u is given to us. It will always be given. Well, sometimes it won't be given to you as a unit vector. So here's a caveat. Here's a possible thing that could happen. You'll be given a direction, but it won't necessarily be a unit vector. Just know how to turn that vector into a unit vector first, and then plug it in. Okay. But that's more common sense. Uh, this times this is minus one over two times the square root of two. This times this is now positive because minus times minus positive. Three over one times the square root of two. I mean, if you really wanted to be picky, I suppose you could do, what's the other top and bottom of you? 
minus two or no. That's a good line. I need to multiply this by five. So do minus five over ten times the third of two plus this five times two so is six over ten to the two. Six minus five is one over ten. And if you want to rationalize, you can um, root two over twenty. I have a question for the class. So what does that answer mean? But how do you interpret that for three months on the curve on the surface? Um, Reading the runs are unit vector. There's a clue. It's kind of in the name of what this thing is. So go back. What, what's the, the, what's the name of this? The directional derivative. Okay. Say it for everybody, Kobe. The rate of change in the direction. Wow, okay. Rate of change in the direction. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so for square root of two over two, what's the interpretation of that? You're standing if you're at the point three minus one, f of three minus one. Um, yeah, so you're going up, you're increasing your elevation that quickly. Yeah. Specifically well, at that point. Yeah. And specifically yeah. in that direction. So there's, lot, there's lots of different pieces going on here, but as long as you have this, I mean, that's not a long formula to memorize. It's a dot product. So if you think of it as a dot product and then just understand that it's, oh, my gradient is one of those members, now I need my direction. It's right there. Okie dokie. Any questions about this? Do you guys see the process outline? Step one, actually just know the formula. Step two, figure out what the gradient is. Step three, just plug and chug. Step four, plug and chug. Step five, Simplify. <laughs> okay, so there's really only one calc. There's like one calculus step here, and it's finding the gradient. Okay, so these directional derivative problems don't be intimidated by them just because Pearson arbitrarily splits it up into annoying amount of parts. Okay, it's a really straightforward process. So practice this process. This is the skill you're going to need to take out. Okay, all right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Oh, quick question actually. Before everyone goes, let me stop this. Um. Thank you.